This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 48 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are new to the podcast, well, I am so glad that you found us. And if you are a longtime listener, thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the homestead journey my name is brian wells i am coming to you from 3b farm and homestead here in beautiful upstate new york and folks it seems like fall is beginning to set in we are starting to have those semi-warm days followed by rather cool evenings no frost as of yet But I am sure that, well, it's not that far away. In fact, I saw somewhere this week on Facebook, and I'm, you know, of course, it was on Facebook, so I try to keep in mind uh, that not everything you read on Facebook is correct. But somebody posted a meme this week that there are only 15 Saturdays until Christmas. So if that is true, then that certainly does mean that our first frost is not that far away here in beautiful upstate New York. But while the frost has not arrived yet, the garden is still going like gangbusters. And so let's jump into this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with everything we've had going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Now, before we get too far into this, let me just start with a moment of absolute honesty. One of the things that I try to do here on the podcast is keep it real. And I'm going to tell you that this week I lacked motivation. I was in a bit of a funk this week, and I'm not really quite sure why. I don't know if it was a post-Labor Day funk or if it's the shorter days or if it's COVID-induced, or if it's because my son went back to school this week, or I, I don't know what it was, but this week I really, really struggled with motivation here on the homestead. And so we certainly got things done, there's no question about that, but I probably didn't get as much done as I could have or as I should have because I was just in a funk. I lacked motivation. My give a crap meter was broken. (laughs) And it really was, honestly, this week it was a bit of a struggle to just get through and get things done knowing that I had things. And and folks, you know how how it is at a homestead. The list of projects is never ending. And so there certainly is that sense of anytime you sit down and put your feet up for even the briefest moment, at least for me, I feel a sense of guilt, like, Brian, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be out doing something, getting a project done, getting something cleaned up, getting something moved. That's just the way I operate. And I've shared that with you before, that I do find it hard sometimes just to sit and enjoy the beauty of the homestead. That's a growing edge for me. It will always be a growing edge for me. But when you couple that perspective with a lack of motivation, just... I'm not going to call it depression because I don't think it really was rose to that level. But I just simply, I found it very hard to be motivated. It's just the only way I know how to describe it uh, this week on the homestead. And I just kind of had to grab myself by the nap of the neck and say, bud, you're going to go do some stuff whether you feel like it or you don't. And, uh, and so I got some stuff done, but again, it wasn't as much as I probably could have got done or as I should have got done. Uh, and folks, that just happens. I think that's just life for all of us. Uh, and that was this week here for me on the homestead. Now I did get another batch of that seasoned tomato sauce made this week. In fact, I had Monday off and once my in-laws left Monday morning, I jumped right into making that sauce and I sat there all day stirring sauce. And 
now it's worth it. I, I love that sauce, but it was a lot of work. And literally I spent my entire Labor Day from about 10 o'clock until about six o'clock when I turned the canners off uh, making tomato sauce. And as I'm stirring it, uh, some of it uh, slopped up onto my thumb and I ended up with a beautiful blister. It was about the size of a nickel on my thumb. And it hurt. It hurt. Maybe to say it was, a, I don't know, it was between the size of a dime and the size of a nickel. It was a good size blister from that blessed sauce. But it was worth it. And uh, so we got some more sauce canned up. Very, very happy about that. Now, on Tuesday evening, my son and I did something that I've needed to do for a while. And that is, I had some piglets that were born in January and then another group that was born in May where I never put ear tags in them. Um, I have tags that I get that actually have what's called a premise ID on them as well as the number of the piglet. And that's just for tracing purposes for you, the USDA and the ability to sell uh, swine across state lines and things like that. Well, I had run out of those tags. And so by the time I got them ordered, uh, they arrived just about the time we were going on vacation the end of July. And I just hadn't gotten around to doing that. So on Tuesday, my son and I tagged those piglets. And then I also took the opportunity to do an evaluation of the latest litter that we had that actually wasn't born here. It was born up in Vermont, that crew that we brought back here that I shared with you last week. And I did the initial evaluation of that, that group. This is the first time that uh, I've bred the boar to this sow. And I was very, very happy with this group of piglets. Again, the boar the, is the father of the sow. And so sometimes you're not really quite sure what you're going to get. Uh, but the confirmation of these piglets is beautiful. The temperament of these piglets is wonderful. I right now am a very, very happy camper with this pairing. And so it's one that I'm certainly going to do again and see how things look the next time around. But if it's any indicator as far as this first litter, it was a very, very good decision on my part to, uh, to pair those two together. And so very excited about that. This week, I also uh, tried uh, something new. And I was talking to a friend of mine at work uh, who dehydrates hot peppers. And he said that what he does with them is he actually smokes them first before he dehydrates them. And so I took some hot peppers and put them in the dehydr. I'm sorry, in the smoker. Um, I still have my dad's smoker here. So I put some peppers in the smoker and then I've had them in the dehydrator uh, the last uh, probably 18 hours. And let me tell you something, folks. The house smells wonderful. I cannot wait to see how they taste because if they taste anything like how this house has smelled, this is going to be awesome, awesome sauce. So I plan to uh, grind them up and turn them into different flavor, uh, different seasonings. We'll kind of, you know, play around with pairing a little of this and a little of that and see what we get. But uh, definitely it was something that really, so far, smells really, really great. And I think it's going to taste even better. I also did some cherry tomatoes in the dehydrator and actually have some in there right now with the peppers. It's going to be interesting to me to see if any of that smokiness comes over into the cherry tomatoes. I don't know if they w it will or it won't, but I'm interested in seeing that. And then the last thing is that I actually have a batch of sauce going right now and I'm doing it a little bit different. Sarah over at Living Traditions Homestead YouTube channel put out a video this week about how they do their sauce in their roasting pan. And so I'm doing it a little bit like she did in that video, except that I didn't skin my tomatoes first. I went ahead and put the skins uh, in there. All I did was core the tomatoes. I'm gonna let them cook down. I'm gonna be pulling the juice off and then uh, I will run them through my squeezo to uh, take out the seeds and the skins before I continue to cook them down and add my seasoning. So very excited to see how all of that plays out. But uh, that's what we did here on the homestead this week. Like I said, probably not as much as I should have or could have gotten done, but that's what I've gotten done this week. And sometimes that's just how it is on the homestead. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course.
I have really avoided talking about the C word here on the podcast, and that is COVID. <laughs> I think we are all sick and tired of hearing about COVID, and so I really have avoided talking about it on the podcast as much as possible. But today I wanted to talk about one of the positive things that I have seen come as a result of this whole COVID thing here in 2020. And that is the fact that people are waking up to the fact that the system is broken. Now, some of us have been waking up to that fact for a while. Um, I think it's kind of a process that many of us go through or have been going through for a while. Now, the fact that we've been waking up to that for a while now, I don't think makes us any smarter or any wiser, etc. I think all of us have different perspectives and different life experiences and different backgrounds and all of that plays into how we see life. And sometimes I don't think you can see a problem until you are directly impacted by that problem. And so I think this year, for the first time ever, some people were confronted by the brokenness of the system. Now, why do I say this is a good thing? Well, the old adage is the first step to solving any problem is to acknowledge that there is a problem. And so I think for many of us in 2020, we have taken that first step admitting that there's a problem. The system is broken. Now, what do I mean by the system is broken? Am I talking about the educational system? Yes. Am I talking about the healthcare system? Yes. Am I talking about the food system? Yes. Am I talking about our legal and regulatory systems? Yes. Am I talking about our political system? Yes. Now, what does all of that have to do with homesteading? Well, in my opinion, homesteading is kind of, or it can be, this weird intersection between all of those broken systems. You see, in some cases, as people are searching for a solution to one problem, they kind of stumble upon homesteading. I think this is true with regards to the broken educational system. I saw a statistic this week that one in 10 families are homeschooling their children this year. And what I am seeing happen is there are a lot of people who are investigating homeschooling and as a result, they are looking at making drastic lifestyle changes. And while they're investigating homesteading, I'm sorry, as they're investigating homeschooling and they're looking at making lifestyle changes, they are stumbling upon homesteading. Sometimes I think people see homesteading as part of the solution. Uh, that's definitely the case with regards to health issues. Long before COVID ever happened, there are a number of people who have found or discovered homesteading as a means to heal their bodies. Maybe they weren't finding satisfaction with conventional medicine, or maybe they even lacked access to conventional medicine. Um, but as a part of their journey towards a natural, holistic approach to dealing with a broken medical system, broken health, they found homesteading to be at least a part of the solution to that problem. Now, obviously, one of the biggest news stories of 2020 has been the brokenness of our food system. People going into the grocery stores and seeing empty shelves, unable to get TP and paper towels and vegetables back in the spring, unable to get meat. Um, right now, people are still struggling to find canned and frozen vegetables. People, for the first time in their lives, were confronted by a broken food system. And so many people have looked to homesteading at least as a part of a solution to that problem. But then once you get into homesteading, you quickly begin to realize the brokenness of our legal and regulatory system. I can't 
begin to count the number of people who have come into the homesteading groups this summer who bought a piece of property on which to homestead. And then they realized that the, the laws were structured, the regulations were structured so that they couldn't do the things that they wanted to do. They couldn't have chickens. They couldn't have pigs. They couldn't do whatever. They couldn't catch rainwater. Maybe they couldn't even plant a garden. I don't know. But they found that the regulatory and the legal system was stacked against them and it kept them from being able to live a life of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Some people found that they could buy a pig from one of these large meat producers because the slaughterhouses were, were shut down and so they were these pigs in the spring were being sold for cheap, but the people bought the pigs and then found that they couldn't find a slaughterhouse locally that was able to handle that volume, not because they were shut down because of COVID, but because of the regulatory framework that exists around slaughterhouses, many of them have gone out of business. In fact, I saw another statistics that back in the, I believe it was the 50s is when the federal government first started oversight of slaughterhouses in the United States. At that point, there were over 10,000 slaughterhouses in the United States. Now we are down to just over a thousand. What is it? The regulatory system and the, the system of laws that exist, it's broken. And it keeps us from being able to live lives of self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability. Some people lost their jobs and they thought that they could supplement their income through cottage industries like making breads or jams or pickles only to find out all of the hoops that they had to jump through in order to be able to do that and the amount of money that it would cost in order for them to be able to support their families. It, it just didn't make any financial sense. Now, none of this is new. This is certainly not new information. In fact, several years ago, Joel Salatin actually wrote a book called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal that discussed a lot of these issues. But as I said earlier, until you are personally confronted or affected by these things, it's tough to recognize that there's a problem. But this year, there were a lot of people that woke up to the fact that the system is broken. And finally, as you begin to recognize the brokenness of the legal system and the regulatory system, you begin to recognize the brokenness of the political system. Yes, I think many of us in the last decade or maybe last two decades have really become increasingly aware of the brokenness of our political systems. And honestly, I don't think COVID really revealed a whole heck of a lot there. But as a homesteader, as you start looking at the broken legal and regulatory system and you start understanding why the laws and the regulations are written the way you are, you really begin to understand how corrupted and how broken our political system really is. So all of that to say, the system is broken. Now, if I were to stop here, this would be probably the most depressing episode in podcast episode history. <laughs> and you'd probably be sitting there saying, well, thank you, Captain Obvious. I salute you. I knew the system was broken. I thought you said that people recognizing this was a good thing. Well, again, as the old adage says, the first step to solve any problem is to acknowledge that there is a problem. And so, if recognizing the brokenness is the first step, what else can we do as homesteaders to start fixing the problem? Now, I think in the short term, there are some things that we can do that, that don't necessarily fix the problem per se, but they're just band-aids or ways to handle the problems that exist. And we might say we might need to get a little creative. So for example, there are some states in the United States where it's illegal to buy and sell raw milk. But people have found a creative way around that by selling cow shares. And so you can buy part ownership in a cow and now what you are doing is not buying raw milk, but you are paying the farmer to care for your animal. And as a result of that, 
you are receiving some of the things that your animal is producing. Now, I get that that's very convoluted, but from a legal perspective, it works. It's a creative solution to a, well, kind of a stupid law, a stupid regulation. So you may need to get creative. And you also may need to operate in some gray areas. Now, I'm not recommending that you go out and break the law. Okay, so just we'll say that to, so I'm covering my own hiney here. <laughs> but there are some areas where it's a bit of a gray area. And you may need to just operate in that gray area. So, for example, um, I have uh, uh, someone that I know who raises pigs. And he will kill a pig and gut the pig and then take the pig to a meat cutter for a customer. Now, that's a bit of a gray area. Is he supposed to technically do that? Uh, some might say yes, yeah, some might say no. There are people who will come to your farm who will kill the pig on the farm and then they will take it away and they will cut it up and then your customer can go pick up the meat from that place. So why would it matter whether or not the farmer does that or whether or not this meat cutter guy does it? And his argument is that at the moment that he kills that pig and he guts that pig, he's no longer acting as the farmer, but he's acting as an agent on behalf of the customer in order to be able to transfer that pig to a meat cutter. I don't know. I don't know as that's ever been challenged in court. I would look at that as a bit of a gray area. Maybe he ends up in court and it becomes a problem. I don't know. But I think there are some times when we have to look at the law and we have to figure out, okay, is there some wiggle room here uh, whereby I can maybe kind of get around this situation. This past spring... I believe it was this spring, it was before COVID hit, uh, I believe, they had in Cincinnati something that they called the Rogue Food Conference. And there were people there like Joel Salatin and Thomas Massey and uh, just a whole host of other great speakers um, who have been on the forefront. Uh, Dennis... Um, uh, I'm trying to remember how to say his last name. Stolfus, I think. He is uh, um, Circle Circle Something Farm in Pencil in in Northern Florida, and he was sued over selling raw milk. Um, but these are people who have been on the forefront of kind of this um, creative ways around the law. Uh, and you might want to check it out. I'll put a link to that conference. They actually, I think, all of the videos and stuff are available online. Uh, I'm not associated at all with it, um, but it's the Rogue Food Con or RogueFoodConference.com. Uh, but that is exactly what they were talking about: is how as homesteaders can we get creative to kind of work around these laws? But I don't think just being creative and working around laws and regulations is enough. I think we have to get political. And this is where I'm going to get in some hot water. Um, many groups and forums on Facebook shy away from politics. They say we need to leave the politics out of homesteading. And on one hand, I understand why. We are currently living in an extremely polarized political climate, at least here in the United States. It's probably the most polarized I have ever seen in my life. It seems like people no longer have the ability to discuss tough topics in an adult-like fashion. It seems like we've lost our ability to have civil discourse. We cannot disagree agreeably. And it's not that we can even agree to disagree. Our discourse has kind of descended into this ju junior high level juvenile insults and attempts to personally destroy people in the re reputation. If people will, won't kowtow to whatever people think they should kowtow to, it's no, no longer can we just leave it at that. But we're going to destroy you personally. I've seen people try to get people fired from their jobs because they were upset over a difference of political nature. 
It's just absolute mind-boggling nonsense. But having said that, folks, I don't think we can afford to leave politics out of homesteading. It's my opinion, as you go through the list of broken systems that we talked about at the beginning, education, healthcare, food, legal and regulatory systems, this brokenness all comes back to bad laws passed by politicians, regulatory frameworks written by, in large part by lobbyists for big ag or big pharma or other special interests that rob individuals of their ability to pursue self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. So in my opinion, in essence, it's all political. And so I think as homesteaders, we need to participate in some political activism. Now, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is that we should vote. I'm not going to tell you how you should vote, whether you should vote red or blue or gold, even though, in the spirit of full disclosure, I am a registered libertarian. <laughs> But I do think that when you go to the ballot box, you may need to start considering how who you vote for impacts how or if you can homestead. If there are initiatives on the ballot, think about how those initiatives might impact your ability to homestead. But I don't think that voting in and of itself is enough. I think we need to contact our elected officials about things that concern us. In fact, right now, the PRIME Act is something that has been introduced multiple times by Thomas Massey in the House of Representatives, and I believe currently it's been introduced into the Senate by Rand Paul. The PRIME Act is an act that seeks to make it easier for state inspected slaughterhouses from meat from those slaughterhouses to be sold in retail settings. That would go a long way to helping homesteaders and small producers be able to bring the food that they raise to market so that people can buy good wholesome food. So Things like that, laws like that, in my opinion, we should be contacting our elected officials saying, hey, I support this. How can you help advance that legislation? So we need to contact our elected officials about things that concern us. But we also need to hold our elected officials accountable. And this is where I'm really going to get into some hot water because a lot of times people are all about, yes, we need to hold our elected officials accountable. But what they mean by that is the other team needs to be held accountable. We don't want to hold our team accountable. We've got to hold the other team accountable. And so people on the other team need to hold their people accountable. Half the time, People won't even admit that their team has anything at all to do with causing or creating the problem. But the fact is, folks, I don't care if you're on Team Red or you're on Team Blue. Both teams have contributed to the legal and regulatory framework that exists that keeps us from being able to live lives of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And so it's high time that we start holding our people, whatever team you're on, hold your people accountable for the mess that they've made. And stop blaming the other team. Yes, the other team has had their hand in it. But we need to get beyond that and say, okay, both teams have caused this problem. What can we do to fix it? And, and I'm also tired. Of, you know, some people will partially get there. They'll say, well, yes, my team has contributed to it, but the other team has done so much worse. No, that's hogwash, folks. I don't care. We're not keeping score here. I don't know, I don't know if it's 70-30 or 60-40 or 55. I don't care. It doesn't matter anymore. The fact is, both teams have corrupted the system, both teams have caused problems, both teams are guilty, and we need to start holding our elected officials, whatever team we're a part of, we need to start holding them to account. Whew. Now, 
I'm not sure if anybody is still listening, but it felt good to get that off my chest. <laughs> but there are some other things I think we can do as well. We can challenge, we need to challenge, and we need to work to change laws that prevent people from homesteading. And this is something that has been happening over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, a great example of that is with people who have been working to change zoning laws where it was prohibited to keep chickens. And I think anything that we can do, whether it's keeping chickens or whatever it is, we need to be working and challenging and trying to get laws changed that prevent people from homesteading. We need to speak out on things of importance. It's not just, I don't think it's just enough to necessarily contact our congressperson, but we also maybe need to write letters to the editor, or we need to go to uh, town board meetings, things like that, that yeah, I know it's kind of boring and I know it's kind of dry, but we need to speak out about things. When a, a farmer is threatened, we need to show up and speak on their behalf. Not that long ago, it was, I don't know, well, it was probably four or five years ago, there was a local farmer who, um, well, unfortunately what happened is you had somebody who was very ignorant about how pastured animals are kept in the winter. And they drove by his farm and they happened to see that he had pigs out on pasture. And they happened to see that he ha they happened to see that he had, uh, I believe it was um, horses and he had uh, beef cows out on pasture, and he had provided the beef cows with shelter. He had provided the pigs with shelter. He had provided the horses with shelter. But if you know these animals, a lot of times they would much rather be outside, the, even when the wind is blowing, than to be inside. A shelter, but some do-gooder uh, came by, contacted animal control, and so here it is. They come and they take the guy's horses, and they take the guy's cows, and they take the guy's pigs. And it was an area where you've had kind of that suburban sprawl that has grown out to where the farms are now. And so you have people coming by who don't really understand what farming is all about. The beautiful thing was, folks the number of people that showed up to the courthouse to support this farmer. People became very, very active and very vocal in speaking out on his behalf, writing letters to the editor, getting in front of news cameras. And eventually the guy got his animals back and, the, and, and, and things moved on. But I believe in strong, in a strong measure, it's because people spoke out in support. Finally, the last thing I think we can do, and this is the tough thing, and this isn't for everybody, but we can run for office. There are lots of local level positions that directly impact how and if we are able to homestead on our lands. So if you can, get elected to zoning boards or village or town councils or county boards of administrations or even state governments or like Thomas Massey has, and many people don't realize this, but Thomas Massey raises beef cows, he raises broilers, he processes them himself. He, in many regards, he raises food. He's a homesteader. He ran for Congress. No, it's not for everybody, and not all of us are going to be able to do that. But where we can, if we can, let's start becoming a part of the solution instead of just sitting back and crying, woe is me, the system is broken. Maybe it's a matter of getting elected to the Board of Education, and that way you can promote homeschooling and stand as somebody who champions the rights of parents to educate their own kids. But whatever it is, I think we need a dose of political activism within the homesteading community to fight for our right to be able to live lives of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Because folks, if we don't do that, I think the other option that we have left is revolution. And I certainly don't advocate for that. 
I hope it doesn't come down to that. But my fear is that if we don't stand up now, if we don't speak out now, if we don't use the tools that we have available at our disposal now, that may be what we have to rely on. And so I'm thankful that right now there are a lot of people who are waking up to the fact that the system is broken. And so my challenge to you is this. Find some way, somehow, to begin speaking out and working to be a part of the solution. I don't know what that's going to look like for you, and I have really done my dead level best to try to keep this as politically agnostic as possible. Because I want people, whether you are a registered Democrat, a registered Republican, a registered Libertarian, a registered Green Party person, a registered Independent, I don't care. I want all of us to come together to become a part of the solution to this problem. Let's rise up. Let's get beyond the political bickering that we see so often. Let's work together so that our kids can live lives of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. All right, folks, that is it for this episode. If you've enjoyed it, and if you haven't, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me by sending me an email, brian at the homesteadjourney.net, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. All of the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes. Check out our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. Uh, we have a shop on there where you can go. It's a link, a bunch of links to Amazon products. These are things that we use here on the homestead. I'm not recommending anything that I wouldn't use myself. These are things that we use that we love. So check that out, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. It's a great way for you to help support the show. And also, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you would leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you like to consume podcasts. Share the podcast with other people that you think might find it helpful. As always, the music on this show was provided by Audionautics.com. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.